I had this light bulb moment, I was like, I'm going to create the world's first fully certified range of CBD and mushroom products. But there was a few times along the way that I really felt a huge sense of imposter syndrome. One of my guiding things every day is I say, you know, like, would, would my dad be proud of me? Hello there and welcome back to the NatWest Business Show. I'm your host, Angelica Bell, and this season we're talking to more inspiring business owners with tales of turbulence, turning points and triumph. And joining us this week is Grayson Hart, founder of Pure Sport, a company producing a range of CBD products and natural remedies to help athletes optimise performance and recovery. Grayson went from playing rugby at the highest level to completely changing paths to become the incredible business success he is today. So without further ado, welcome Grayson. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all, not at all. Now before I delve into your incredible business story, I want to ask you about a business confession. We ask all our guests this, it's their first question. So something that you've had to overcome, a hardship, a hurdle that has got you to be the successful person you are today. What is that confession? My confession is I always knew when I started Pure Sport that I was never going to be the guy that excelled in like the numbers and the spreadsheets and the finances and, and like even like the logistics and things like that. I, I had a real vision and a passion um, to bring that vision to life. But there was a few times along the way that I really felt a huge sense of imposter syndrome, uh, or I still do to this day. And, and a, a key example of that is our first ever capital raise at Pure Sport. We'd been going for two years. We'd seen some unbelievable growth. Um, we were out to raise capital and um, to further accelerate that growth. And on one of the calls uh, with these, you know, really successful business people that were really interested in investing in Pure Sport, it was quite an intimidating experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're running through all the numbers and what we'd achieved revenue to date. And one of the um, people asked me on the call, oh, is that net or gross revenue? And I just literally did not know what that even meant. I didn't know the answer. Um, And it was unbelievably embarrassing. I was scrambling to try to find the answer. I was two years into this great business. And everyone's there and, you know, asking this question. And and I was, you know, preparing myself like I used to prepare for a big rugby match. I've got to put on my best foot 40. I've got to, like, have all the answers. Um, but what I had known in that two years is that it was so important that I get the right people around me that understand and have the strengths and the knowledge that I don't have. Um, and, and in that moment of feeling so embarrassed and ashamed that I couldn't answer that question, um, it, it brought me back to a lot of memories that I had growing up where, you know, in school, I, I really was not a success, uh, academically at all. I got into a lot of trouble, um, and really struggled to kind of fit into the system. And I grew up feeling like I was not smart. But what I have learned through Pure Sport is that as a founder, CEO, like you have to have an understanding of things, everything that's going on in your business, but you don't have to be the expert in everything to be a successful founder. It's Mm -hmm. also a skill to be able to bring the right people around you. Well, history tells us that a lot of people with neurodiversity have been very successful. Maybe mm. we need to talk about that more and yeah. celebrate that. Yeah. And you managed to overcome that by, like you said, working on your strengths and weaknesses, but mm. seeing that's where I'm good at. So I'm going to explore that and have other people around me who yeah. can help me with the other bits that, you know, you know, I need a bit of work on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't know, I, I always had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder as a kid. Like, I would question the teachers, like, why, why, like, why do we need to learn that? Or, you know, but what about this view? Or I'd ask questions. And although I'd never achieved things in school, I, I had some sort of underlying thing that was below the surface level that was like, no, but like, I do have something to offer. Like, and it was such a tough struggle between feeling like a failure and being told I was distractive and not, you know, not, not doing well to being like, no, but like, I want to do well and I do feel I have this energy in me that I want to express. Um, so, yeah, I feel really passionate that, you know, business is an opportunity for people 
who see things differently that maybe struggle to, uh, you know, bring out those strengths in the normal education or employment system, that there is an opportunity yeah. to, to flourish. Well, Grayson, you have done well and you're a role model and you've had this very successful career. And I think your business journey is different to a lot of people's experience. So let's go back to the start um, and talk about how Pure Sport came about because you were playing rugby. I mean, living the dream, lots of people want to, you know, play on this, that level yeah. that you played at. Um, so let's give us some insight into that. Yeah, so I grew up in New Zealand and we loved our rugby and I dreamed from a young age to become a rugby player. I managed to get my first contract at the age of 19. Early in my career, I suffered a knee injury and... Um, Rather than getting the surgery that I needed, um, I need to like stay out and finish that season. And that meant I got injections and used painkillers. And then I never actually ended up getting the surgery. So what I have had this knee that was sort of wearing and tearing throughout my the remain the rest of my career, or uh, sorry, I had this knee that was wearing and tearing over the next couple of years. Eventually it started to get very, very painful and I got sent for an MRI scan. And by this point I was around 21, 22. And the MRI scan came back and the specialist said, your knee is in atrocious state. Um, you're going to need a knee replacement by the time you're 40. We advise that you stop playing rugby. Um, and that was a huge shock to me. I, for me, I just thought I had a bit of a sore knee. Um, and so what that did was it was a very scary moment. Um, and from there, I started to become very, very reliant on painkillers. Um, so I'd take a lot of painkillers and then I used to have a lot of injections into my knee. Um and then a couple years down the line of just living that way, and because that was the Norman sport, you know, it's a rough game. You're very competitive. You need to stay out there. You need to train. You need to play. Otherwise, you're not going to progress. And you're not going to, if you don't progress, you're not going to have a job. Um, and it was also a very kind of like, this is the paradigm in sport. It wasn't really open to like looking at different alternatives. It was always like, this is the, this is the way we do things. Um, and, about two years down the line of being very reliant on the painkillers, I had this moment, I was like, I I am so unhealthy. And I didn't even realize how much it had crept up on me. And so what I did was I started researching what are my different alternatives that I can do to taking these painkillers. Um, and that's when I discovered this amazing world of CBD, which stands for cannabidiol, and uh, which is an extract from the cannabis plant. Uh, and it's completely legal, it's non-psychoactive, it doesn't get you high. And then I also found out about the uh, amazing power of um, mushroom supplements, things like lion's mane, cordyceps that have amazing benefits on the body. And I was like, wow, like, I, I never knew about this stuff. Um, so I started trialing it. And because at that time there was no, none of these supplements had ever been certified for drug tested athletes and we always advised to take certified uh, supplements for athletes. I sort of researched and I made my own informed choice of like, what the risks were and what, whether I was willing to. And the risks were very, very minimal, um, but the risk was like, you know, I might get in trouble from the club because they're not certified. But it was important to me to look after myself as a human being, especially like after the life I had and what I'd seen, what my dad had gone through with drug addiction and and what that had done. And, you know, obviously reliance on painkillers is very different in the, the, the path here, but I was always very aware that I never wanted to come reliant on anything like that. And when I learned about all this stuff and started taking it, it was the first time in a long time that I was able to function without painkillers. And I literally, I just felt like like a haze had lifted. Like I felt more energized, more clear-minded. And what but then that, would, wouldn't that have caused a bit of conflict? Because obviously with, you know, in the sporting world, and we hear about it a lot, that, you know, you're monitored, things mm. that you put in your body. And would that have caused some conflict mm. with what you were doing at that time? Yeah. And that, that, that was the point that inspired pure sport because after a few months, uh, I had my one of my checkups with the team doctor and he sort of had realized, oh, like you're not taking these um, painkillers like you to, to the level that you're getting these prescriptions and painkillers off me. And then that's when I said, oh, well, I'm taking these products. And I had actually done all my own due diligence as to the drug testing and what was in the products and the risks. And I, f I had made my own decision uh, as a as as an individual, you know, as what was good for me and what the levels of risks were, and and that's why I'd chosen to kind of keep that decision to, uh, as my own decision. And but obviously, when I opened up and he'd asked me that question, I told him, 
And he said, I need to check with the club if that's okay. Right. And he came back uh, a few days later and he said, look, you can't take those products because they're not certified under the um, level of certification that we need for drug tested athletes. And I had this light bulb and I was like, I'm going to create the world's first fully certified range of CBD and mushroom products. And I actually look back on that time, I was like, ignorance and naivety was bliss because I did not know how hard that was going to be and what how hard business was going to be. But I'm thankful for that because if I knew, I, I would have been probably too afraid. Um, but I just felt so excited and so passionate. And a, a big hurdle initially was like to convince my wife that this was a good idea. You know, I was a rugby player. I don't have any education. I was trying to create something that in my world of drug tested athletes wasn't allowed. So I was trying to change that. Um, and then I also had to convince her that this, all of our savings that we'd kind of like put everything into to try buy our first ever property together, I, I need to convince her that this has to go into this business now. And and like I'm still so grateful to her to this day that you know she believed in me and she she gave said go ahead, um, and I just went for it and I used some of the like knowledge and like skills I'd learned in rugby, which was there's this in in the world of rugby and professional sport you have this access to an unbelievable network around you, but it's up to you if you tap into it. And that was something that I always knew was a valuable thing to do in rugby because I knew I didn't have an education uh, I, and I didn't have skills outside of rugby and I wanted to tap into those types of people to learn from them. Well, yeah. you saying that shows that you're smart. Thank you. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I think that sometimes we have to look at what, what an edu being educated and also being smart yeah. and, and knowledgeable. How does your wife feel now? She's happy with our decision um, <laughs> and she's like so unbelievable, unbelievably supportive. The one thing that she often kind of like, not, not, not in a serious way, but she always kind of says, man, like you used to have so much more time. <laughs> <laughs> so I think she, she wasn't aware of like, and I also wasn't aware yeah. of how like just all encapsulating this would become. Um, but again, she knows she's so passionate about it. I'm passionate about it. And we just feel grateful that we're able to build something like that. And, and I feel grateful that I have her support there. I'm going to just pause, pause things for a minute. Is that all right? Because yeah. we're just going to head into a section that we call Trending Takes. Okay. Oh. Um, our team have been sort of looking at sort of like the trends that we can discuss. Yeah. In more detail. Yeah. Number I'll one. Do my best. I'm not real on trend kind of guy, but oh, I'll do my listen. best. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's, it's, you're on trend, trust me. <laughs> okay, your greatest asset is not your physical ability, it's your mental ability. I would 100% mm. say that the mental side is so much more important. That's what I think. Yeah. If your mind is clear, and your mental state is, you know, in a good space, that frees you up to make good decisions. Yeah. And and as even back as a rugby player where physical exertion and like state was so important, um, there were times where I was physically at the peak that I'd ever been in, but I had neglected my mind and I couldn't utilize the physical state to the level that I needed to because my mind wasn't clear. Yeah. Ready for number two? Ready. It's better to go with your gut than overthink it. Yeah, 100%. I think... Well, that's what you did when you yeah, did the business. Yeah. Albert Einstein, that's one of my favourite quotes, he says, the intellect is a profound tool. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift. We live in a culture that has become so obsessed and praising of the tool, the intellect, and by doing that, we've overlooked the sacred gift, which is our intuitive mind. Okay, and finally, trending take number three. Failing is the best way to achieve success. Yeah, I, I can honestly say like some of the biggest difficulties have opened pure sport and myself up to realizing strengths and also finding opportunities that we hadn't seen before. You you're probably going to make a lot of mistakes. But 
the best growth and sometimes the best opportunities come from mistakes. Yeah. I need some more trending takes because we could just go on forever and ever, <laughs> but I only had three. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now listen, if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, please continue this conversation because there's lots of food for thought there from Grace and just put all your comments below. I just wanted to touch on the CBD because many of your products, you know, contain CBD, but it is a contentious ingredient. You know, some people know little bits and some people are just like, no, 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 I'm not going to go there. What challenges have come with this and how have you managed to educate people about the benefits that it gave you, changed your life yeah. um, and other people who you've, you know, I've read about have benefited from your product? Yeah. So the, the main challenges are, there's, there's obviously a stigma around anything that's derived from cannabis because, you know, the main viewpoint that our culture has around cannabis is that people smoke cannabis, which the main component that gets people high is THC. Mm. And and that's the kind of like narrative and viewpoint. So with CBD coming from cannabis, even though it doesn't have any of the THC element that gets people high or is addictive, um, we needed to clearly differentiate and educate and raise awareness on that. Um, and I think a lot of the younger generation and with, you know, who were empowered by like YouTube and podcasts and like access to information via the internet, they're like, they were, it was easy with them because they understood uh, or had access to their information, uh, or not access, but like were empowered to go after that information. And also that narrative wasn't as like solid in their minds as maybe some of the older generation, um, but particularly with that older generation, it's like realigning the view that, yes, this may come from something that you have a, a perspective on that may be negative, but this is not the, this is different. You know, this is something that's really can be very beneficial. And then the other thing is people, ex we've, we've kind of got this culture now, in my view anyway, that we've come so accustomed to like quick fixes or things that mask issues. Um, like, you know, when I was taking all those painkillers, they weren't helping at the core of the issue. They were masking the pain. And actually a lot of the time that was causing more issue because I wasn't aware of how much like, you know, pain and that, that, that was going on there. Um, whereas natural uh, products like mushrooms and CBD, they interact in, like, in synergy with your body and they don't just sort of come in and make a quick fix or mask an issue. They're designed to work in synergy to help optimize the functions of your body naturally and sustainably to find like ongoing solutions so trying to like realign people's mindsets to like you don't just take this and feel like something straight away just like it's about consistency it's about being part of your lifestyle so is it fair to say that part of your business model was education educating yeah. the consumer about what you you know to differentiate between those other yeah. um, businesses, what you were about and the actual benefits of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I kind of learned for the first time that, oh, like maybe I do have a business mind because at first I just was like, I want to solve this so issue. Solution that you had, dilemma, me. yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, and then I'm going to like get all the other athletes out there that have to only take choose to take painkillers because there's no other option. I'm going to help them, you know. But then I thought about, I was like, oh, something – that's targeted at only drug tested athletes. That's not a very big customer base. There's only so much growth you can have. Then I thought about, I was like, the world of sport is you looked at in terms of how you optimize your body and your mind and performance uh, is at like the highest level of, of being ahead of the curve in that regard. So I said, if I can get these products certified for drug tested athletes and utilize, you know, my network and the fact that no drug tested athletes been able to take these type of products before, I'm going to use that platform of sport and these amazing athletes to show the wider world and accelerate that like knowledge around these products. So my view all along with Pure Sport was it's not just for drug test athletes. This is something new and innovative and ahead of the curve that I'm going to utilize the world of sport and the platform that it has to inspire other people and educate other people. So not just keep it contained. Yeah. It's, you know, Ex, you know, expand it to the general consumer yeah, and yeah. they can enjoy those benefits. Yeah, because I think more so than ever in recent times, people are really interested in like human performance, like optimizing their day-to-day -day productivity, energy levels, uh, activity levels, um, and 
people through the access, you know, like I said, they have like podcasts and, and YouTube and internet. People are like able to gain knowledge really quickly now. And it's great. It's created like a culture that people are empowered, you know, and we want to be able to have something there that, yeah, helps inspire those people and helps optimize their lifestyles. Well, Grayson, well, what advice would you give to small businesses who are trying to market a product that the wider consumer isn't aware of or doesn't understand or doesn't know much about? Yeah. I mean, because that must have been a huge hurdle for you yeah. to overcome. I would say, firstly, like, you need to truly believe in your product. Like, you need to know that it's the best that it can possibly be because marketing shouldn't be trying to sell something to someone that it isn't. You, you should just be able to truly speak about and share what what you've got that you truly have pride in, that you believe in, that you're passionate about. Um, and I always like say to our team now, like, and, and you know, it's, it's one of our values at Pure Sport, we never rest on the standard that we're at in terms of our products. We're always pushing for like 1% better every um, time that we do a new run of products before that and in that pipeline we're looking at what little details we can always improve and the reason that is is because when we market our products when if we know in our heart that they're the best they can be that marketing is going to be received in a way that is authentic and I don't think enough people consider that people out there intuition is strong yeah you know and we overlook, like, I think, you know, you can get a copy and paste model of, like, marketing and be like, oh, you do this much digital advertising, this much influencer marketing, email marketing, all of that. But all of that truly, to me, is most impactful when the product it, it works, it's true, and you know that you're doing your best. Well, now that you talked about marketing... Um, let's bring in branding as well. So what advice would you give brands wanting to stand out, especially when households are spending less and less? From the beginning, everything went into the product and then there was nothing left for the design, the packaging, the website, all of that. And I always looked at these things and I was like, I want this all to be of the standard of the product. And that was always my inspiration. I also realized like for people to purchase these products, like I remember at the start, I'd get five orders in a week in the beginning and I would go before rugby training because I was still a full-time rugby player when I started and I would handwrite the names and I'd go to the post office and I used to look at those names and I'd be like, thank you so-and-so and I'd say their name like, because they had no reason to believe in us, you know, and, but then I'd, sometimes I'd feel embarrassed because they were paying good money because the products weren't cheap to make. And like I was, it was a handwritten thing, and like, uh, and and the packaging wasn't very good. And I'll be like, almost like I want this person to when they receive this to feel like this is the best because I know what's in the bottle is the best. So I wanted that every touch point for people to know that like we'd thought about it. Yeah. Um, and I want that to sit on someone's coffee table or counter in, in their kitchen, and them to feel proud that they are investing in themselves and. That's what, in my view, what I want pure sport to mean to people. So what you're saying basically is that you have to respect the consumer and let the consumer know that what they've got is amazing, but also that you're grateful that you're that they're investing in you. Yeah, yeah, because I I think about spending that much money and I'm like, that's people are truly investing good money in this. Like, give them the best. And even things like, you know, I've had different people come and give advice and things like that. And, and I always respect everyone's advice. But I then what I do is, and I think it maybe comes from my childhood where I question the teachers. I, I, I love talking to people that know more and have more knowledge and more experience than me. But I'll never just take the advice. I always question it and challenge it in my mind or think about my perspective and their perspective and see where it meets. And I've had people be like, don't spend as much on the packaging. Uh don't why do you need to do next day delivery uh and, and then i think i'm like okay that's good advice and they're talking about the margins and all that but i don't believe my business will grow and that my customers will will buy in and have the loyalty for this type of product if i don't give every element of it the best that we possibly can do um and so that's that's for me one that i don't there's no sort of like negotiation on 
the more I listen to you and your experience, I believe that everything that happened to you in your life and also your sporting career helped has helped you and, and will continue to help you be the successful business person you are. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I I hope so. <laughs> if, um, I mean, I know there's so much that I don't know and that I'm like learning as I go. And I also know, I feel quite strongly that like, you can't take anything, anything for granted. Um, and in business, it, it can be quite uncomfortable at times because you've come such a long way yet you feel like you can't rest, you know, it's the, the nature of a startup is almost like, it's kind of scary because no matter what you achieve, you got to keep pushing because if you rest, you could be gone in a year, you know, like um, you got to be pushing always to keep that momentum. Um, but I also, yeah, I think learning from my life of rugby uh, that you could have the season of your life and, um, get player of the year one year but if you don't rock up to pre-season with the attitude to better that it's worth nothing you know what I mean so you agree with me <laughs> yeah, yeah I agree, I agree. <laughs> no I, I definitely <laughs> um, now building your business is very important to you like you just said and you've got loyal communities haven't you around pure sport like with your run clubs I've looked on your Instagram you're always in your clubs you go all over the world don't you yeah. as well um and your fitness club, and that's really helped to grow your business, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was, again was like an accident. Um, well, well, not an accident. It it was something that has evolved organically. So when I retired from rugby, so first two years of Pure Soul, I was a full time rugby player. I was trying to build up on the side, and we had had no funding or anything. And my view was, I wanted to build it up to a point where I could take enough of a salary to pay or rent and bills and then finish playing rugby and like really like just give it everything and then I got to that point and then we're working um and I had three people within the team with me um that were you know like friends actually that had come on board that were helping me work on this business and we're working this co-working space and I still remember it to this day one of my friends uh William Gooch he's actually just run across the whole of America it's crazy um loves running and he found, he, his mum passed away and he found the, that running was like something that really helped him deal with that pain. And I remember sitting in the office and I said, man, like, I feel lethargic and I feel uh, unmotivated to train because I don't know now what my motivation to train is because it used to be like to perform on the rugby field and yeah. I'm finding it hard to be motivated. And I said, but I feel it's having an impact on like my energy and productivity. And he goes, oh let's go for a run after work. And I was like, okay. And I never was really into running at all because for me, you just run to get fit to play rugby, but not just run to go for a run. And then we went for this run together and it, it, I noticed that I felt good. Like it helped me clear my mind. It, it actually helped me feel more energized. And then while we were out running, I was like, oh, like why don't we invite some people like next run we do and we invited like some friends down and then the next time there was like five of us and we went for this run after work and then while we we're out running on that day I was like hey should we start like a run club because we had like a group of ambassadors as well by that point for pure sport and then I was like why don't we start like a run club it'll be a cool way to like connect with our ambassadors and stuff so then the next one we had about 12 people down and then it just started to like grow you like the Pied Piper <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it just built grew and grew yeah and then one thing I realized, right, when people, we started to put it on social media that we're doing this run club. So then our community, our customers would start coming or people that followed us on social media. And I had this thought, I was like, one thing that was really cool as a professional athlete was there was these photographers, pro photographers at the game. And then they would be taking photos of the players playing the game they love. Yeah. And after the game, you get sent these albums of like these photos of you doing what you loved. And it was cool. Like, it was a bit vain, but like you, you'd sometimes go through like, oh, like, yeah, like that's yeah. cool. That's what I love doing. And then I realized, I thought about it, I was like, these people that come, they really love exercise. They love running, but they've probably never had a professional photographer take a photo of them doing the thing they love. So the next week I organized for a photographer to come down and we had about 20 to 30 people at that point. And I had, and I got consent from you. I was like, oh, we're going to have a photographer and, you know, I'm going to share a link. Is everyone okay? Like, yeah. So then we made this WhatsApp group. And it had all the 30 people that came to that run club and I shared the link to the photos. And then what happened was all these people shared the photo 
to their Instagram. And then what happened is the next week we had about 80 people come to the run group. No. All people saw it. And then I, and I had this, I was like, oh, like that builds traction. So we just kept doing it. And then we never like asked anyone to share a photo or anything. Like it was just because we provided them something that was cool to them. Yeah. And that they were proud about. Yeah. And then what happened was people that saw it aligned that to pure sport and it helped uh, us grow our community. Yeah. Um, so this is the power of community at all levels, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And people want to buy into that yeah. togetherness yeah. and that feeling good. And I think that's so cool. I mean, I might start taking pictures of myself at the gym. I might feel yeah. a little bit better. Yeah. I'm like, come on, we can do this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like, I think that, that we worry too much that people are going to think we're vain or cocky but like what why should we not be proud of the stuff that we love doing you know and show it to the world right yeah what's the most important piece of advice you've ever been given Grayson best piece of advice is just be yourself I know it sounds simple but in this world there's so many concepts of how we need to be and actually like you'd be amazed at intuitively what you you know and the decisions and the direction that you've got within you if you just allow the noise of how you're meant to be or the concept of what you should do when you allow that to fall to the side and just trust your intuition um that that's a a, a great piece of advice and yeah sound advice yeah. That, that, that was one that really impacted me because, again, coming back to the first question you asked me about the confession, you know, I for so long was ashamed of, you know, like not having having an education or feeling that I wasn't smart enough, whereas actually allowing things within me that made so much sense to come through, I started to realise, like, oh, I do have strength and my intellect works in a way that it, 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 it does it does work like there is meaningful stuff there to offer um but when you have the concept of what that should look like it can often stifle what's true to you do you fancy some rapid fire questions yeah <laughs> <My best. laughs> okay let's do that now who is your business inspiration M my business inspiration is it's actually my dad and my dad wasn't a successful businessman but what he inspired me with was he overcame so much adversity yeah. for the people around him and he also had very little to offer like materially but he had so much love and kindness to to give to people and it it really helped me align from an early age like what success meant to me and you know like one of my guiding things every day is I say you know like would would my dad be proud of me and there's sometimes some decisions I make or some actions I've had I'm like or oh, he probably would have said otherwise you know maybe question that one or do that differently and then but then the majority of the time I'm like yeah like dad we proud and that that like motivates me like infinitely so yeah he's like your guardian angel yeah yeah he is because yeah when he passed away it was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me but I had this moment probably six months later that I, I just felt like he was still with me mm. it made me feel like I can do not not like I can do anything like I can just go out and do whatever I want but like I've got this <laughs> That was a long, quick pass. <laughs> I know, and, you're make, and I'm trying to hold it in here, Grayson. Okay, best piece of business advice you've received? Got to have clarity on the the finances. Favourite part of running a business? The ability to, like, bring a vision to life and, and see it come to life. Least favourite part of running a business? Trying to understand the finances. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One thing nobody is talking about in business that they should be. There needs to be more scrutiny on are people truly selling what they say they're selling. The one thing you wish you knew starting out? That at no point does it get easier. I think at the beginning you believe like 
it, there's going to be this point where it gets easier. It just changes, but you learn that that's actually what business is. It's problem solving and you learn to like enjoy that. Your confession was about the intense feeling of imposter syndrome. Do you forgive yourself, regret it or wish to forget it? I forgive myself and I'm grateful for the lessons it's provided. Thank you so much, Grayson. That's it. The interrogation is over. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. What we've all learned is that even though your career may be heading in one direction, it's never too late to pivot into new avenues of success. And thank you for listening. Don't forget to hit follow and subscribe so you don't miss out on our next guest with even more inspiring stories to tell. And if today's episode has inspired you, head over to the NatWest website for information and tools that'll help you take those next steps to success.